Hello. Hello. We're going to give it a few minutes for some folks to join before uh, starting here. So just let me introduce myself. My name is Asad Fazi, and I'm actually, this is the first time I'm joining it. And I, I'm very interested in um, in being an active member, active part of that. Oh, cool. Thanks. Glad, glad to have you. Yeah, we're just going to wait a few minutes for um, more folks to join before uh, uh, officially. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the same thing that you are doing. I'm going to get myself a cup of coffee <laughs> because it's um, I, I in Pacific time zone, it's 8 a.m. It's too early for me to survive without coffee. Cool. Uh, so yeah, we'll, we'll give it like uh, about five minutes for folks to join or a few minutes for folks to join. Um, and while folks are joining, feel free to um, add your uh, attendance to the document as well as um, Uh, as well as anything you want to add to the agenda. It's relatively light agenda for today, just because first week back from KubeCon. So I can see you speaking, but you're on mute. Oh, uh, no, I wasn't actually saying anything. If, if that was the case, uh, I just I'm... sometimes move my lips. Not wrong. I do the same thing. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> similar, yeah. Yeah, just give it, uh, yeah, so I guess we could probably get started here. Um, so let me copy paste the document one more time. Uh, give me one second. I have just too many tabs open. Um, and uh, there it is. Uh, so anybody who joined, feel free to add your attendance, anything to the agenda. Um, so just as a reminder, this meeting is being recorded. It'll be uploaded to YouTube shortly thereafter. Um, and uh, uh, this, you know, um, your attendance, uh, sorry, your participation in this meeting is uh, an agreement to abide by the CNCF code of conduct. All right, cool. Um, so I know, uh, looks like, uh, actually, Asad, did you want to, um, reintroduce yourself? Just because sure. now that we have uh, more folks. Uh, so sorry, guys, not turning on the camera. I have in a very bad shape, it's eight in the morning in, uh, in, in Seattle. Uh, I'm actually, my name is Asad Fazi. Uh, my, uh, I'm the founder in, uh, of a startup here, uh, background in uh, software architecture design and development with the expertise in cloud. I'm, uh, I'm very interested in uh, pursuing, uh, you know, the, the, the entire uh, software supply chain, securing software supply chain and zero trust. And I'll be uh, actively participating in that moving forward. So thank you very much, everybody. Welcome. 
All right. Yeah. I believe that's all the introductions. So yeah, so let's see here. Um, so we can start with, um, I think shortly, just like a, I know a lot of the folks on this call were all at KubeCon um, and the various co-located events and just wanted to see if there was any interesting talks or discussions or just sort of general things that folks found interesting about sort of supply chain security while out there. Yes, we can. Oh, Justin. Oh, uh, Justin, if you're talking, I don't think we can hear you. Can anybody else hear Justin? Uh, I'm not able to hear. Oh, it looks like the internet maybe is cutting out. Oh, uh, well, Justin's up. Oh. Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, I don't know. It, uh, is anybody else seeing that? Uh, it keeps cutting. Yes, yeah, it can't it's hard to hear. Quickly, yeah. Uh, can't um, hear anything. So there are obvious. I think his connection is bad. Maybe just turn off the camera. Oh, he's reconnecting. All right. Um, is anybody able to hear me now? Yeah, much better. Okay, great. I was just going to say, um, if you went to the conference, you heard uh, SIG store, SIG store, SIG store, SIG store, SIG store, like 800 times. Um, and I just wanted to give a little follow on that we've been talking and working with the SIG store folks who are um, pushing to integrate full CO uh, signing and stuff into Tuff and record validation and stuff like that. Um, and uh, both sides view the right way to use SIG store in the future. Um, it seems to be that that tough will be like the default thing around around it. So this will like sort of be the way they'll integrate it because they already actually use tough in a lot of the ways they're doing things already, like distributing the root certificates and stuff for full CO and record. Um, and they have a lot of kind of limitations around key revocation and and stuff like this and um, namespacing and tough like handles all of those. So uh, we're looking to have a closer union of the projects in the future. Cool. Yeah, um, that, that sounds awesome. Um, as far as the OCI, Jimmy, do, do you have a, uh, any info about the, um, what would you mean by OCI there? I, I, I can talk about this actually if oh if sure yeah um, so yeah I notary v2 is in kind of a funny place um, so you'll be able to view the talk and things um, it it seems to me like what they're doing is they don't have a design done for a lot of the parts that they're working on um, and trying to push, but they're trying to push it through a standards body and then argue that this is a measure of quality. Um, so it's not clear to me who actually is, is going to really use this um, and what the fate of this is going to be. Uh, there are parts of Microsoft, for instance, that are already using um, competitors to this. So, um, and Microsoft is, is by far the most aggressive actor pushing in this space. Um, I'll also say that, I mean, I, 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 we're all security people. So probably when you took your security class, if you've taken it recently, 
you learned about why OCSP and certificate revocation lists are not actually very good systems for revocation and all the problems they have. Um, and those are like core parts of what the notary V2 design that was presented was leveraging to try to do those aspects. Um, so it, it's actually one question that I think will have to be answered is whether this is going to go through, at some point, it's going to have to go back through a security review process of the broader design. Um, they've had a, a review happen on specifically a small piece of signing code where they got two audits for it. But this piece of signing code was, you know, it's just not like a big part of their overall design. I think if they go through a design assessment in this, in the, a broader tag security group, or if they get an outside group to do a security assessment of their system, I think they're going to get a lot of notes, um, to put it mildly. So, um, yeah. And, and once again, I, there's not like, I don't think there's like a working system that people are planning to use or stuff. So, um, I, I hope that that helps to fill in the gaps. So um, with respect to notary, um, it's part of another, uh, there's, there's multiple projects that have been working around um, a, a non-six door, you know, non-cosign solution, right? So notary V2 and um, or as um, in conjunction with the uh, Ratify project have all been working together um, kind of dependent upon, well, Ratify is dependent upon ORAS and Notary um, as well. Um, so uh, there is work being done there. I just, you know, yeah, it's still nascent. It's nowhere, you know, near uh, ready as, you know, six-story cosine are, obviously, but the work is actually underway. Yeah, and, and I think um, I would definitely suggest like the folks who are maybe working on the notary stuff to maybe attend some of the like uh, these meetings and, and and those sorts of things as well, because uh, we'd love to obviously hear more about, how, you know, how things are progressing and, and, and what's kind of going on there. Um, but I think just yeah, generally yeah, I'm, I'm like, sorry. we oh, if, go ahead. If you have any um, like links or things about these that we can read more about and understand the current state. If you could drop them in the meeting notes, um, I think we'd be pretty curious to get caught up. Yeah, I'll, I'll get some links to you. Um, the, the actually the the note the notary uh, project, actually the notation project under notary, just released beta zero twelve yesterday that includes uh, trust stores and trust policies. So uh, yeah, I'll I'll put some links out there as well as for the ratify project. And and do you happen to know um, when they're going to go? Like, so I imagine notation because the design is completely different from what notary was when it was admitted into the CNCF is going to go back through the process of asking to be part of the CNCF and the security review process and things. Do you know when all that's going to happen? I don't know if that's going to happen or when that's going to happen. Um, I've got meetings later on this week to talk about additional things. I can ask about that as well, but um if we can track that in the notes as a, as a question that's being asked, certainly I can uh, go back to the folks that I know are working on that portion of the projects and, and ask them about that. Um, I primarily am working on the um, Ratify project that's using notary and or as libraries under the covers. Um, so, and that, and that will also be using um, OCI references uh, going forward. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll reach out to the folks. Um, I think the, for, as a point of reference, the Ratify project is, the last I heard is looking to go GA sometime in uh, January. Um, but obviously the caveat there is, you know, dates can change based on, you know, how things move. Is there anyone who's planning to use it like right now that has firmly signed on? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by plan to use it. I mean, the project itself is, is, uh, supported, um, by, uh, folks from Microsoft, um, some folks from AWS, um, and, 
I, I think some folks from, from other companies as well. I, I don't know. I personally have not talked to any, you know, customers that are looking at this. Um, I think it's kind of unknown at this point. Okay. Thanks. Cool. And I, I, we'd love to actually also see, um, I'm sure even the general, the more broader security tag, would love to see like the progress, like in a demo or something as well. That'd be really cool. Um, all right. Cool. Uh, well, so what else uh, have folks sort of seen at, at KubeCon um, uh, that, that they found um, sort of interesting in the, in the sort of supply chain space? Um, I know that there was a good deal of. I saw some interesting chat, you know, talks from some folks like um, Brendan Lum and 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 some other folks on like uh, um, S bombs and and I'm blanking on actually who who his uh, co uh, speaker was at the at the time, but uh, there's some interesting stuff that was being talked about with regards to S bombs that I know is something that was a big topic earlier on and maybe something we want to um, bring back up in the future of just. Uh, sort of act and I it will lead into I think Justin some of what you're going to talk about later which is like sort of the the accuracy and completeness of s bombs um which is very much varying um today uh specifically around stuff like uh uh you know different a lot of the different um s bomb tools that exist today uh most of them can be compelled to create invalid s bombs uh let alone not complete s bombs um and that's kind of one of the things that i know kind of came out of that and i believe actually uh who was it parth you knew uh, you spoke to somebody um yeah. from ebay right who's who's looking at maybe doing an, a, an assessment of like all the different tools that are out there yes. to see like so i think uh, so in the in the CDF, basically, um, in the supply chain maturity model, uh, the meeting we had yesterday, um, or a couple of days ago, actually, but basically the thought process is one of the things we wanted to look at one of the um, was to see how S bombs differ in terms of, you know, if they're, if they're produced during the actual build process or after the fact, right, how does that differ? And what kind of information is missing? Um, you know, when it's done after the fact. And at the same time, it, how complete are some of these S-bombs? So I think one of the things uh, that I was going to work with uh, is Justin Abrams uh, from eBay. He brought up the idea and I was going to assist him on it is in terms of maybe creating some kind of a security scorecard for S-bombs in terms of like, hey, how accurate, how complete is the data that, that is being produced? Um, and then and, and kind of judge that, you know, just give like, hey, this is a, this is a valid S-bomb or, you know, this is, is this S-bomb it's actually useful, it contains useful information for us that we, that is actually valuable and not just, not just, you know, meeting a compliance check that, that companies are trying to do. So having that kind of uh, assessment uh, and a scorecard for it, I, I think is valuable in making sure that everyone's kind of moving in the right direction and getting value out of S-bombs. Yeah, I think uh, just one example of, of that is like, uh, Sift can generate valid S bombs, but based on like let's say you take SPDX, um, if you don't provide it SHA one, um, it will you know generate a SPDX S bomb with you know SHA two fifty six or whatever um, for the hashes. However, the SPDX specification says you must include SHA one, um, which then makes it technically an invalid S bomb from the spec. And one of the things that we've seen now that we've been sort of building out tools to consume these s bombs that we want to make sure that everybody's actually following the spec otherwise it it makes uh consuming this stuff next to impossible cool. um cool uh anything else um i think um besides that i think ebpf is really picking up popularity um in terms of kubecon i think there's a lot of talks on tetragon uh, you know, including uh, myself uh, gave a talk, but I think Tetragon has changed the way, you know, people are kind of look, looking at a uh, runtime. Uh, and I think that's 
just for the better. So I think there's a lot of talk on that. There was an EBPF day, but I did not attend. So I'm not sure if anybody on the call attended that and saw anything interesting. But cool. Um, I know uh, we showed off a little bit of uh, Guac, which is trying to help answer some of the supply chain questions as well. Um, that's a tool that Google, ourselves, City, and, and Purdue have been building out, uh, along with a bunch of other contributors in the open source space, um, which uh, hoping to maybe give a demo on that in you know maybe an upcoming meeting as well. Uh, what else? Um, in the supply chain stuff. The, the uh, X-ray, the S-bomb X-ray thing. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, that was that was pretty cool too. That talk was worth watching if you weren't there for it. Hey, hey Parts, um, I'm sorry I'm new to this, so please bear with me. Did you say uh, Tetragon? What was the so software that you were talking about? Yes, Tetragon. Okay. Can can you share the link here in the chat? Sure. I'm not able to find it. Cool. Um. Cool. And uh, just a reminder while we're on the topic. Um, so uh, there was also Cloud Native Security Con at the event, but now we're also doing a uh, uh, CNCF is now, or not CNCF, LF, I should say, is now going to be hosting um, Cloud Native Security Con as a standalone event. Um, it's in February uh, in Seattle. Uh, which days was this again? Um, February 1st and 2nd uh, in Seattle. And uh, the CFP had its deadline extended, I believe, to... Oh, it does not show... Uh, it's actually not showing up. It still shows up as Wednesday, November 9th. I believe they moved it to the 11th. Um, does anybody remember that? <laughs> um uh, let me just remember. Uh, so cloud native security. Uh, CFP deadline has been the thirteenth. Has been extended to the thirteenth. It looks like they haven't updated the website yet. Um, oh, to, it is. I oh, is it? it was. All right. Oh, at least on yeah. this page, it's it's not. Um, and maybe that's just something that we uh, bring up. Um, but anyway, uh, just a reminder, if folks want to, you know, um, have a talk, submit your talk by the, was it 13th, whatever it was? Yes, 13th. Uh, 13th. And also remember that the, the, a few days after that is the close of CFP for KubeCon uh, Europe. So just keep that in mind. Um, cool. So uh, I'm going to hand it over to you, Justin, for um, talk about verifiable SBOMs. Okay, um, thank you. I am going to put a link to the document in the chat here in case anyone wants to open, but I'm not going to go and and go through it in detail at this moment. Um, I'll just give you a pitch over what the project is supposed to be about. And then um, one of the things I'm most curious about talking about is how to proceed and what involvement this group or others should have and how we should structure things. Um, so first, uh, I went to a, uh, the week before KubeCon, I was invited by an IoT sort of platform maker to come and give a keynote at a conference they were having. And uh, as part of that, um, I, I learned that they have like thousands of customers and that are selling, you know, millions of IoT devices out there that are all deploying Tuf and uh, well, the variants of Tuf Uptane and doing stuff with it. And there was a lot of interest in their side from integrating in Toto into this um, because they sort of, you know, I, I think, you know, with it being in lots of places and them wanting to have verification and stuff, they saw it as, you know, the technology they wanted to use. But a lot of the um, end de like device makers who were using this platform were like, you know, we what we need is we need S bombs, 
And we need SBOMs because there are like actually regulations that, for instance, if they're making medical devices, they might have to have them. If they're making trains or other things, you know, using this IoT platform, then they were going to need to have this sort of stuff. So um, that got me to start thinking like, you know, wouldn't it be nice to have all the security properties you get from doing something rigorous, like, you know, in total layouts and in total link validation, S bombs, you know, SPDX, Cyclone DX, whatever it is that people actually needed in this space um, and allow them to kind of augment and do things. And the idea is to do this to solve a few problems at once. Like one of which is when you get an S bomb, it's actually not particularly useful today because they're very, very often inaccurate. And um, with an in total layout, you basically know it's accurate because the cryptographic metadata had to be generated at each of the steps by the parties listed in the layout to do the actions performed. And, and so, um, you, you know that, that those steps happen because you have all the kind of, you have the cryptographically signed attestations from it, if that makes sense. Um, so I went and started talking to people at KubeCon about this, and it turns out that this sort of problem and things related to this are a very common concern in this space. Is like, you know, wouldn't it be nice to have S-bombs that we knew were accurate, were easy to set up, and were actually, um, you know, like uh, gave you meaningful guarantees uh, that that your pipeline was doing these things. And so, um, based on that, I sat down with a group of a dozen or so um, bright people who I talked with um, over a lunch, and we jotted down some notes about how this might work. And then after that, um, I worked with a smaller group and refined those notes a little bit and people chimed in on the document and started to ask questions and so on. And so I think this is something that, you know, could potentially move to be uh, maybe a uh, like a sandbox level project. I don't know if they have that concept, but something like that under the open SSF. Um, it could continue to be under here, under part of the CNCF. We could figure out a way to do this, but I'd like to at least um, figure out where the right home for this is and who's interested. I want to be very inclusive. Um, I don't, you know, I, I don't really have a strong, um, like super strong opinions about how this should work and how things should go. I think uh, in general, as a community, when we do things, security community and people when we together, we end up with, with much stronger results. I think if we fragment and become very insular, then we end up with uh, usually much weaker systems. And so I, even people that might not uh, always agree with everything, I think can be valuable voices as long as we all abide by a code of conduct. So with that being said, um, I guess this is as much a question for Michael as anybody else is, um, oh, I guess, so sorry. So Alex, I think you might have a question here. Um, yes, okay. So this is a very good question and maybe I can, I can sort of answer this um, question, which is, well, you know, we use these scanning tools. And, and by the way, if I, I'm gonna paraphrase your question. If I get it wrong, please tell me. But my understanding is we use these scanning tools and we can make the scanning tools better and we can do things to get them part of the way there. And I think fundamentally, it's not going to be possible to make a scanning tool that is going to be effective against a malicious attacker. I'm not talking about someone who, you know, has built stuff into your supply chain and done things, but someone who, you know, got into your supply chain and is trying trying to insert something and hide it. I think that that you're just not going to be able to do that because the general problems that you have to solve are like you know Turing complete problems you would have to solve to understand if code has certain functionality and is done in certain ways. So um, I. 
I scanning, I think is helpful to do things like generate an initial candidate of what an S bomb could be for the thing. But if you want something where you have, you know, bet your life kind of assurance that this is what's in the thing, I don't think a scanning tool will ever get you there. Um, and so this approach that, that is described for verifiable S bombs, we do actually first scan it to create a candidate of what the in total layout might look like. And then after that, we go in and actually go back through the build process and make, you know, the build, the dependency resolution process, taking all the other things in that need to happen. And then from that, we fill in that and any gaps or added things or incorrect things will automatically will be noticed because cryptographic, you know, like hashes and things won't match. So Frederick, did you want to say something? Yeah, I was, I was just make a quick suggestion. So I agree with you in principle with the premise that you mentioned about uh, some of the attacks being Turing complete and you cannot always stop them all. Uh, that being said, there's still useful techniques in that they raise the cost and risk to the attacker. So for example, if you have something that uh, is external to the build, it scans for uh, outbound uh, network calls. Like if you see something abnormal, you can it still gives you a red flag that you go in and chase these down. Uh, so, um, so in the, in the messaging, I would just uh, I'm, I, I would recommend being a little bit careful in some of the in some of the wording there, uh, just to just so that we don't end up uh, ruffling feathers from people who are pushing in in that direction, and we end up with a fight between like yes, it's useful versus no, no, it's not. Uh, it's the question is. Uh, what is the cost of performing, of adding it in, and what is the benefit? And we know that there's limits to to the benefit that it provides. So just want to be want to be careful. Yeah, that. yeah that, that's a great point. And I didn't um, I didn't mean to say that that they're not useful. And in fact, the thing you're talking about with monitoring outbound network traffic is part of the in total runtime attestations that you might do as you're doing this as part of your pipeline. So that part is actually an important part of what is captured in in the verifiable S bombs, and, okay, uh, but the broader point, I completely agree with you. I'm any signals you're getting, you want to be able to capture those and use those. But there's a difference between um, capturing and using something and relying on it to be an absolute bit of ground truth from a security standpoint. So what, cool. what are good. you proposing that you would rely on in this case? Because when I think of, when I've looked at like in Toto attestations, they don't defend against a malicious builder. You know, the, the builder can claim, hey, I ran these five steps and output this artifact and then they sign it and they, you know, as long as they have whatever key they're signing with, they can sign whatever they want to. Doesn't mean they actually did what they claim they did. And so I'm trying to get an understanding if, what are we protecting from in the S bomb case in the scenario of we say, okay, here's the S bomb. I actually did this stuff. Here's my output. Where where is that security coming in? Yeah, there there's a, you point out a very fundamental problem because there's no way to know in general that a compiler compiled the right thing, even if it's not malicious or um, you know it didn't have a bug and create a bug in the code. And once again, this isn't a solvable problem, um, but you can know that it went through the process. It took things in, a key attested that the key that the, uh, you know, that the build system had was used to sign the thing to say this is what happened, and that it produced this thing out, and that that thing went through the rest of the process. And if, you know, in the case of what might you do, you know, of course, there's other techniques with reproducible builds and doing other things to harden your build system that help. Um, in Toto in general, and this work specifically isn't trying to tell you that the step you actually performed um, is the perfect, correct, secure step. But it's trying to say that the thing you said you performed, like that this, the, the person holding this key is the one who said they performed that step. And this is what they said happened. And so at a minimum, you end up knowing who to shoot in the system when things go wrong uh, with this. But you're you're correct in pointing out that really no solution could ever provably give you something that you know is a correct build, um, and you just have to use mitigations like reproducible builds to try to make that less.
So if I was to compare this between what we have today with potentially a signed SBOM, are you, are you proposing that we have not just the signed uh, bill materials, what's in there, but also the the steps, the input and output steps in addition and included in that SBOM set? Summing yeah, up. And, and you have all the steps of the software supply chain, where you got your dependencies from, the hashes of those dependencies coming in. You, you basically understand all of that, and that's all been cryptographically signed by the parties who are doing those actions. And so um, that gives you a much higher degree of assurance. Like you get the real visibility into the supply chain. Um, and once again, there could be something malicious. Like you could have gotten a malicious, um, the wrong version of a dependency, you know, that, or, or someone upstream could have substituted something in there. But now you have a hash for that and you have other things. So someone later could go and detect what's happened and figure out what's going on. It's no longer like the black box is, is no longer really that much of a black box. There's a bunch of smaller black boxes that have generated cryptographic metadata that's all linked and signed. So one example uh, that plays into this. So every part of a, every step within an Intoto uh, attestation can be signed by a different uh, party. So you could do something, let's say you had a reproducible build, you could have a reproducible build built twice, one by each, uh, by two groups who are independent of each other and then make sure that they come up with the same set of, of outputs for the same set of inputs. Now, of course they could collude, they could, you could have something upstream that was injected, that was injected in, uh, but for those particular steps, uh, it raises the total cost of, of the compromise uh, of, of, of an attack and gives you some visibility into what the process is so that as a downstream user of it, uh, you don't even have to be at the same company. You have an internal application. You at least have something that says, this is the process that we followed. So uh, the a key there is that, you ha is that you can separate out those different principles for those given actions. And when you are capable of separating out the principles and then your ability to defend against certain types of attacks uh, in increases in your, in your capability. Uh, the real value to me there, though, is the reproducibility. And then when you, if two different builders output and say, hey, I reproducibly built this artifact, it's got this signature, I've, I've signed it, and also it's got this S-bomb, the S-bombs match from each other, that's valuable. Um, when I've looked at this before, I was doing a, a proxy in the middle of the HTTP request, and one of the questions I thought is, if I'm recording all the HTTP responses from one request and then replaying them later on to do a reproducible build, how do I know I didn't have malicious data in that traffic? And so trying to take your next step of saying, how do I know that all these hashes are really good hashes? That's kind of kind of be the challenge of how do I really know that all these inputs were right the first time? Well, as they say, it's turtles all the way down, right? So if if your thing is, if you do your thing in a secure way and people use you, then they have a higher degree of assurance. And if you know, you're know you using things that have done decent security postures, you have a higher degree of assurance. So um, in fact, even more specifically in Toto, you can, a layout can refer to other layouts in it. You can say like, this is the known correct way according to the developers of uh, the Zlib uh, library, how to build and we defer to them basically to do that. And so, um, but yeah, I, I mean, in general, from what I've heard of people, at, you know, talking to them, organizations are going to start to be moving away from dependencies and things that use worse and worse security practices. There's a lot of discussion around this. And so I think if we solve this in a good way that people realize is a good way um, and they get value out of and is not too onerous, then we have a real chance of that having a domino effect and a rippling through the ecosystem very quickly. Yeah, I'm kind of going in the direction of the, the recent salsa calls where they dug into saying it's not just good enough to generate all the provenance, you need to verify that the provenance was generated and verify that the right provenance was generated. And so when I look at an SBOM coming out, it's 
And it's good if I'm ingesting it and actually using it. You know, that, that's the next step. If we're generating all this extra data about the inputs, I just want to make sure that there's some thought on the next step there of, okay, we've got the data. We know what all the hashes were on the inputs. We need to do a validation as the next step to make sure those were really good inputs. Can I ask a more fundamental question for my own education? What's the goal here? Is the goal that we create these, uh, like uh, if we have one set of tool chain and we generate the SBOM through this with, this, with the source and sign it, you know, and then we should be able to take this uh, as bomb, sign as bomb, which is totally portable to another set of tool chains and be able to validate and verify that. It is, it, do we want to make, uh, achieve that, that once we generate and sign an as bomb, it's totally portable to any tool set? Is that what we're saying? Here? No, um, that's not a goal because different tool sets check signatures and do things in different ways. Um, we, we want you to know that, um, with a high, you know, by having these signed attestations and also a verified layout, which is the really important part that isn't on in a lot of places where they use in total, uh, validations, but the layout that stitches all these steps together. So, sorry, let me, let me back up and just speak in more general terms rather than using techie like nerdy in toto terms. But basically you have steps you do to build your software. You know, you have a version control system that has your code in it. You have a bunch of dependencies that you pull in from different parts. You have a build system that might be part of your CI CD pipeline. You have tests you run, you have all these things. And so what the in toto layout and other things in the system do is they make it so that all the parties who do these steps have separate keys on their devices and they're signing metadata about what it is they're doing. And that's called link metadata or attestations is okay. our, our two names for this. And what the layout does is it makes sure of things like it makes sure that the thing that, let's say you signed a git tag, uh, You're breaking up. Oh, uh, Justin, uh, you're, to, you're as part up. of your release process. Uh, sorry, if I break up more than, okay. Yeah, uh, you're, you're back. Still Keep bad, going. Or is it bad? You, you're back. back. You're back. <laughs> okay. If I get bad again, then Aditya or Marina or someone, please step in. Um, but basically, then you know you have your sign get tag. And the thing that is your sign good tag is the thing that's supposed to be built by the build system. And in Toto checks that the secure hashes of all the things that came out of your sign get tag are the things that went into your build system. And okay. you know, the sign, uh, like the um, dependencies and where they're supposed to come from and the signatures on that match the things that go into your build system and so on. And so it links everything together and gives you cryptographically, you know, attested. Uh, series of steps that must have been the things through. So, you know, things like, you know, that this package, the, the thing that got built passed the unit tests, if that's one of the things that you're required to do. And, you know, it is the thing that got packaged and so on. And historically, there have been lots and lots of problems with companies accidentally, you know, skipping steps or malicious people going in and doing things in the middle of these steps. And so, you know, in Toto, in many cases, will stop those attacks. And in other cases, will at least tell you exactly what was compromised and give you sort of like a verifiable way to know where the problem in your supply chain is actually at. Okay. I think I will much clearer idea. I don't 100% see the clarity, but it much, much clearer than before. Thank you so much for that. Sure, no problem. Yeah, um, and I wanted to piggyback super quick on the point that I think uh, Brandon had made just a minute ago about like reproducible builds and stuff. Um, you do want the two build systems to do things, of course, but in the end, you also have to 
you know, check that they have the same output. And if you have a box that checks they have the same output, then the question is, like, if an attacker breaks into that box, can they just, you know, like, not do the check or, you know, skip even both of the builds and just insert something else or do something like that? Um, or, you know, do you have multiple signatures on it? And then how do you decide, like, you know, to check the signatures and handle all those bits and pieces? And so, um, what are the philosophy is in a system like in Toto is that you describe as you describe that there are these reproducible builds and so on. Um, these separate build systems, however many you have, will generate the builds, and then the in Toto step will go and do the verification as you do the validation, redo the validation for everything else. And this is why I think um, in Toto is also the way that like you know the people who do reproducible builds basically, you know, seem to always do their validation at the end for Debian and these other, these other big groups that do a lot of this. Um, so in total, it's like the part of that process that's important for doing the validation. So question on the layout, um, is that being generated manually? the actual layout that's going to be, that defines, uh, right, to check against, validate against? That's a great question. Um, okay, so today, a lot of people generate them manually, and it's a pain in the butt. We have tools to do it automatically, and they're so-so. In the verifiable SBOMS document, um, I have a pitch that the way we should be doing this is to use some of these scanning tools just like the, the ones that were mentioned uh, before in the, the chat by, uh, shoot. We, we had that, there was a very nice question uh, from Alan. Alan in, in his comment and everything. Um, so they're very valuable to give you a 90% accurate view of what's actually in there and to make generating the layout very usable and easy. Um, but uh, in the end, then you go and as you actually make your software and generate these in total things, you, yeah, you don't have to have it. You can still include it in there again. You can always run it and include the information from it in the uh, things that are included in the SBOM, but it's not, um, yeah, yeah, if that makes sense. I feel like you still have a question, Parth. I'm just judging by the look on your face. Go ahead. No, I was just trying to think, you know, just, just um, you know, based on some of the comments Alan is making too, right? It's like, hey, some of these things output different information. Which, which ones do you trust? Which scanners do you trust, right? So it's like, hey, like, if you're going to create a layout based off some of these tools, right, you have to trust them in, in, implicitly. Like, you have to be like, yes, these are the ones that I would trust, and I know it's going to give me the proper outputs. Right. If they're giving us, if each tool is giving us different outputs, I guess it's. No, no, no. Uh, here's a way to think about it. Right. Um, yeah. Which is, let's say that, um, let's say that, that we're going to try to generate a blueprint of your apartment. Right. Um, and there are different tools to take the pictures, the photos you took in your apartment and we'll generate different blueprints that look slightly different. Okay. But in the end, um, a professional is going to come in and they just want to have a general layout and a general idea, right? So the professional, it's helpful for them to understand what they're getting into, but they don't overly rely on them for, okay. you know, okay. that's not the source of truth. The source of truth right. is the metadata generated when you do the build that contains the link steps and other things and that layout from Intoto that you end up agreeing on in the end. So you mutate that, that data out of the scanner to become the real layout as you generate your code another time, as you go through your, your build, et cetera, process. Mm -hmm. Understood, okay. So there would be some intervention, manual intervention that you, you yourself have to be like, okay, yes, I agree to this and consolidate all the data, okay. Does that does that mean the 
corollary to that is that we are not looking, um, in, even in future, we are not looking at fully automated tools, tool chain or software um, that fully automate the entire process. Uh, you know, I mean, like from the time you are pushing the code in the uh, and get till it gets built, and you know, like picks up by CI/CD unit testing and all that stuff, and then containerized and somehow along the line, it's automatically the S bomb is getting generated and signed and attestations are attached and all that stuff. Maybe some policy is getting generated, uh, you know, some policy attached, document is also getting attached. And then it is when it's deployed, you know, it's uh, validated against the policy. And uh, so we're not looking into a total automation of that entire supply um, chain. You're so you bring up like an interesting point. So the answer is, I think, both yes and no. And yeah. the, the no part of the answer is, if you think approaching this with the scanning tool will work in a situation where there's adversaries, I think you can never get there. And so we wouldn't. But I think if GitHub and um, you know all the other things that you're using to do the steps you're doing automatically were creating the necessary in total link metadata and you were collecting it, then you could automatically make the verifiable S bomb. And effectively you would skip the scanning step and skip the making the in total metadata step. Um, so there is hope to get to the point that you're trying to do but it requires buy-in from the people that are doing the steps in your tool chain. Okay. So one real world example where that buy-in was not possible to that level or to that degree is uh, NPM is starting to look at uh, creating uh, some, some functions around uh, their supply chain and trying to get better provenance there. And one of the proposals was let's get the developers to start signing their commits uh, or signing the tags before they uh, before they contribute up to npm. That was strongly rejected for various reasons, largely which was the a large the burden it puts on the developer. Uh, event you'll end up with just a fork of the npm uh, package system, and then there'll be another one that ends up uh, running that's that's a lower barrier to to entry, and they'll lose a lot of developers along the way. So instead, what they're trying to focus on is when you submit into NPM, you have that signed, you have a tag that, they, that NPM itself can sign to say, this is that version that matches that and run it through their own build system themselves. So it'd be like an NPM hosted build. And uh, what that allows you to do is even though you don't know who the people are who, uh, who contribute to the code, if you, you, we have the ability through Alpha Omega and other similar processes to do security audits on the top packages that then allow us to say this specific version, irrespective of who contributed it, uh, has been scanned by these companies and has been audited by these companies in these specific ways. So you're looking at the actual content of that thing as opposed to the, uh, the individuals who signed it. So uh, in short, what I'm, what I'm trying to say here is that the, uh, the method that you actually pick is very contextual to your needs and based upon the cost and the trade-offs that you're making uh, based, that is very specific to your individual use case. So yeah, in short, that's. But I, but I think the question was, will the metadata be automatically generated or not? Or is the metadata something that you would be manually generating please correct me if i'm wrong justin that was the yeah. point it, and and uh, i think frederick um you had like a really interesting comment there about this um npm could generate this metadata themselves too it doesn't you know they would effectively say we are the ones who take the thing in and we don't know where it came from and, but it went through our build process and that, that also which i think what assad and is is pointing out yeah, that, that's exactly what they're doing. So they're not relying on third party organizations to produce that metadata. There's some metadata that they cannot put a strong claim on, like who's the developer who sent this in? Uh, they could say, what was the token? But they can't even guarantee who the developer was because there might be a compromised token. 
Um, but uh, but it does give them the ability to generate a lot of that information so that you at least have a, a known starting point and then you can extrapolate from there. Yeah, and, and once again, like this proposal and just in total in general are not saying that the steps that were performed or the provenance of things is necessarily good. You can literally say my step is to like curl this code off, you know, HTTP off of some website and, and run it as part of my build process. You can list that in there, right? But then that will appear in your SBOM and visible as, hey, you're doing this really shady practice. Um, so, you know, we're not trying to judge whether that practice or whether developers should be the one, you know, signing things and then uploading it to NPM. We're not trying to um, put judgment on that. We're trying to surface that and make sure that the SBOM accurately reflects that that is the steps, that that step was a step that was taken. Um, now I have four minutes, there's four minutes left in the meeting. I don't know if anything else needs to happen, but one thing I did want to know is where's the right place to actually discuss this in detail? Is it in this meeting? Should I spin off something different? Is there like, what's the right place and way to do all this? Uh, sorry, I, I joined late, but I, I can answer this question unless Michael, or you want to take that? <laughs> No, no, no. I was actually just going to say, uh, I probably defer to Brendan, but I didn't realize you joined. So yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry. I was, I was on, I had to present the SPDX call. So, um, um, so I would say, uh, th this kind of like straddles a little bit of boundary between like, you know, um, design versus I think there's also some aspects of engineering and recommendations. Um, traditionally we've tried, um, so we, we, we did have a hand of trying to do something engineering, like in the past, like, uh, a year or so, and it just like failed miserably. So I think for, for like, in terms of like engineering work, we are going to keep that right now, um, out of scope for this group. So I think that, um, you know, if, if there is an aspect of it where we want to add the like best practices or or things like that, or um, that is something that we can do. But I think in terms of like, um, kind of building out, like flashing out the detail, I still think this is going to be like, uh, maybe in total project specific things. And then I would say, um, uh, we could come and maybe, um, add to like, so the white paper V, V, V3 or a new iteration of the supply chain's best practices to kind of maybe add a few more details in that. Um, I think that will be the most helpful um, for the group as well as for you because like um, we've tried to kind of have more engineering design decisions in this group and it's kind of gone towards more like best practices for people kind of work. So I don't want, don't want to yeah, um, but, waste the time there. I mean I think from our standpoint, or at least from my standpoint, um, we'd like to get the like a specification, other things together. And I don't, I, I want to do this with the community because I think if we sit down, like if a small group sits down privately and does this, um, it's, it doesn't, I don't, I just don't think that's a good way to do something like this that we want to have broad buy-in and broad acceptance of. When we did not obtain, for instance, um, the tough variant that's widely used in like automotive and IoT, we had 50, 60 people from different OEMs and regulators and stuff in the room. And we drove the, we did the work to drive the design, but they were heavily involved in discussing the points and going through things. So um, maybe we can be the engine that drives the car, but we want everybody to help us steer. That yeah, so I, I, I think what, what would be helpful that we can provide, and it's like, you know, obviously we, don't, we wouldn't have like some of those people that you want from this community. Some of them are from different communities. So I don't want to drag them over here just for the sake of it as well. Uh, I think if, if anything, having like a separate effort and just trying to pull the right people in, and I think what we can do is like maybe monthly or whenever there's like a, you think it makes sense to have, we can have 
oh, here's a request for comments uh, for this work in this group, and then get the feedback that way. OK, so what I'll do is um, I'll try to build out a different group. I'll set up a time. And I'll um, put an announcement in the in the Slack here, and also I, I would uh, also I I think just to make things easier, so I think it would make sense for that to be part of um, in total. I don't think you you want us mm. to do the governance for that as well. I think it's uh, I, I, I I think in total well, is I, uh, I think we might move to Open SSF. Uh, we would put this as a project under there. But I, I, if there's no objections, if there's a reason why we want to keep it in, I like I, I mean it's clear that this isn't, well this is kind of close to in toto, but it's definitely not in toto, and I don't want it to be seen as an in toto thing. Um, I think it would be a disservice to like the CNCF if I take a project that's substantially different than what they admitted in, and then say this is part of it. I, I think that needs to go through a separate process, as I think is being widely discussed. Yeah. So but, uh, I, I, I'd rather have it be separated out. No, I, I agree. I agree. And I, I think I think the main point that I'm trying to articulate here is also like, I think we have to treat this like any other CNCF project. But it's hard for us to be like, oh yeah, you make this tax security thing um, and kind of like sponsor it that way. Um, so I just want to be a bit careful about that in case like you know people are like oh you're having favoritism because your TL grades in the project and you know, it's kind of like you're bootstrapping it this way. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, maybe you like I, I don't fully understand the concerns in that area because all I'm kind of using are a Slack channel on the CNCF. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, sending I, an I, advertisement, I, but I, I'm yeah. not. Eventually, we might ad apply through the normal channel for Sandbox and CNCF, or more likely the sandbox equivalent in open SSF. Um, but I, I just wanted to kind of recruit people here and talk about it. Yeah, I, I, I agree with, um, with you and Sir as well, in terms of not seeing the concern, like as long as none of us say that it's part of the, uh, that it's part of the, the tag, like we're all free to work on whatever things that we want. And the fact that we may have other people here, I think should be, should be okay. Um, but eventually if we decide to, donated somewhere, uh, then uh, as you mentioned, we go through all of the proper channels. So I, I think we're, I think we're good there. And, and I, I don't think we'll, we should see any complaints. Sounds good. Yeah, just, just be really hey, careful not to say it's a tag. Be... Um, oh, sorry, please. Yeah, we're over time, by the way, just if I yeah. keep people as I was just going to say, I'm going to send a link to the channel here. So please join the verifiable SBOM channel in the CNCF Slack. And I'll try to announce things. And periodically, uh, I imagine someone from our from this will come and give talks in this group also and just loop everybody in in case you're not able to join that or join our meetings whenever we end up making them. Awesome. Thanks, Justin. All right. Thank you all. Thanks. See everybody later.